ready? Um, we are going to open up now and we'll start with the angel of the house, Miss Wilson. All right. She's the angel. <laughs> all of you all are angels. I want to say good morning and welcome to Sankofa Safe Child Initiative. We're looking for an exciting and informational day. I'm glad to see so many of you smiling faces here. I don't like them grumpy ones, but <laughs> we have no grumpies today. Maybe tomorrow. Let's let's just be happy today. But I just want to say welcome and uh, uh, to the first of uh, I think uh, of our capacity building informational sessions. Uh, I always start with prayer. I don't care wherever we go. Is somebody bigger than us that knows all this stuff? So we have to have him. Ed, would you come in and kind of, uh, not kind of, pass the egg? Mm. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this uh, moment, this meeting, this time where we can just um, figure out the best ways in which to serve this community. So center us, gather us here, keep us on one accord um, as we find the best ways to serve. Keep us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to one of our people that are leading us today, uh, Valerie, and there'll be several other people. And uh, welcome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Valerie Leonard. I think I know about half the people in the room um, for several years. I think I know another, what, 30 or 40 percent of you just through emails and your sign up. And, and, and forgive me, I went to Chicago Public Schools. I don't know what the other percentage is. <laughs> oh, bad, Valerie. Not, that is bad. <laughs> Honestly, I, I went to schools when uh, Chicago Public Schools, you didn't have to go to a magnet school or selective enrollment school to get a good education. I'm taking from people, uh, somebody who has both parents being teachers in Chicago Public Schools. But at any rate, I want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us in person. Um, if you haven't noticed already, we have donuts, we have punch back there. Um, help yourselves, make yourselves at home. Um, you may need some sugar to, to stay awake. I promise you it won't be boring. <laughs> but um, the purpose for our program is really to give you a good overview of the program itself. We're going to be doing R3 capacity building. And what we've noticed over the years, you know, this is not just a problem that has just come up and it's, it's consistent, is that, you know, the people who are closest to doing, you know, to doing the work with the various uh, clients may not always be the people who get the larger grants. And a lot of that is not because we don't know how to do the work, we have problems you know translating our knowledge into the systems and i will say that happens to me i've been doing this work for over 30 years and i still myself have issues translating what i know sometimes into the system so what we thought we would do is have community cohorts to actually you know, learn from each other and go through this process and She's not here yet. Um, State Rep Collins, through her generosity, she was able to get the direct appropriation from the state legislature. And when I say direct appropriation, what that means is rather than going directly to a specific agency to respond to an RFP, we were able to do a proposal to her let her know how important it was to actually do more capacity building in that area and not only to learn how to respond to the R3 programs but to build capacity for our organizations, build leadership capacity 
and all of that good stuff. Along the way, I met a guy named Mike Cannon. He's not here yet. He's supposed to come here later. And he's like the pipe piper pulling everybody from the re-entry community together. So I met him one day, and we haven't been strangers <coughs> since. And then he introduced me to Della Reese. And, and she's been very, very helpful to me from day one. So we're not going to hold you up any longer. We're going to start with Delvis Adams. She is the executive director for ICEJA. And she will tell you more about you know, the capacity building that they're doing. And God willing, we will come together and be able to leverage this grant that we have with what I see that is doing, they're about to embark on a comprehensive capacity building process as well. And we can leverage each other's programs and you know, make things better for all of us. Yeah. All right. So without further ado, let's go. Thank you all. So I have notes because I'll go off on a tangent and start telling you all about my morning and the things I want to make sure you all know. But as um, Valerie mentioned, I am the director of ICJA, which is the state administrative agency for the R3. So happy to see so many familiar places. Um, many of you know my story. I came from the city, then went to the county, and I'm at the state. So I've kind of done grants and all the local government. So I see a lot of my city grantees. I was a grant monitor, always in community at the county, um, worked directly with the reentry um, violence prevention and all of the um, criminal justice type of grants. And so I've been at the state for close to two years now um, and very entrenched in equity, right? And so a major part of equity is making sure that all of us who have been disinvested in who have been under-resourced, not only do we get access for the, to the money, but that we get the, the proper resources that we need and technical assistance and capacity building so that we're successful, right? Because we don't want people to say, oh, you've been neglected, now we're gonna give you a whole bunch of money. Oh, you failed. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. You didn't need that money anyway, right? And so a large part of what we're doing at ICJ, because historically, um, our monitors were not built to provide that level of capacity, right? So if you get a state grant, it's all about compliance, it's all about rules, it's all about the paperwork and the reports, and there's no hand-holding. So if you don't get those things in in a timely manner, then you're kind of put on the list, or you're, you know, put, you, there's a mark on you that you can't handle the grant. And so we're kind of turning that corner and saying, it's our responsibility to make sure that our partners, because I don't do any of the work, my staff don't do any of the work, all the work is done by you all, that our partners are equipped in a way that not only can you provide efficient and effective services, which you have been doing for, I don't know, by, by show of hands, how, how many been in business longer than five years? I mean, you've been doing this work a long, long time, right? And so you know how to reach the clients, you know how to reach the community, but how do you get on that other side of your business? Right, because they want us to say it's a nonprofit, it's not a business. You have to run it like a business. So, just to share a few things that have happened under my administration, um, we have really tried to make our three a premier equitable program. Um, how many people in here have ever applied for our three funding? Okay, just two. So, mo three, four, five. So, most of you all have not applied whatsoever. How many of you know about our three? Okay, so about the same. So many of you don't even know about it. So what Valerie is gonna to present today is gonna to be very helpful. But for many of you who know about it, what I found as we've gone around to do our own outreach is that people know about it and they feel like we're not ready. It's too big, it's too competitive. Like we can never compete with these larger organizations. And so we're here and we're moving around and going to this. So you might see me in some other <laughs> community meetings and saying like, we want to make sure you're ready, which is, I'm so grateful that Valerie had the foresight to go to um, Alderwoman Collins and say, look, this is needed in our community. Um, is that, okay, because I'm going to shut up and let her, let her <laughs> kick us off, but we're going to reveal from the agenda a little bit. But that she had the foresight to say, hey, like this is needed. Our three premise is really taking 25% of cannabis money, 
-hmm. And we know that the Cannabis Act was passed in 2019 and it out preceded any projections. It is a billion dollar industry. So there are people in the industry, but then there's also the fact that the legislators had enough foresight to say, hey, these communities were harmed by these laws, were harmed by mass incarceration and over arrest for drugs and marijuana sales and use. And now how does the state write that wrong? So they, they write it that wrong through our three. And because that money is going back into community, we want to make sure that black and brown communities actually get the money and are able to provide those services that they have. So I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful older woman and let her pick us off. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll come back up and um, finish my <laughs> Not the older woman. I'm the state rep. I'm sorry, state rep. It's okay. I mean, you know, people speak everything in such questions. Good morning, everyone. So I'm state representative Lakeisha Collins. Sorry, I'm still in my coat, but I am like on the move today. It is Thanksgiving week and my birthday on uh, Thanksgiving. Hey. Hey. Um, but so I've been a state rep for about two years. I'm in my second time now. And since I've been in office, my main drive has been to make sure that we uplift our communities, the black community. I sit on the Black Caucus, the Joint Black Caucus as a secretary. Um, and so that's also the executive part of our foundation. So I help to make a lot of the key decisions in how our caucus move. And so the R3 program um, is really the baby of our Lieutenant Governor, Juliana Stratton, who took a lot of time to create the program. And so when we talk about disinvestments in the black community, the brown communities, uh, marijuana was one of the things that really, really, really um, played a role in mass incarceration of our young black and brown men, women, and persons across our state, across our city. And so when Ms. Valerie came to me about um, her organization and this plan to make sure that we educate many of our nonprofit organizations who are grassroots, boots on the ground, front and center, they are doing the work, uh, oftentimes go unheard or have opportunities for funding, I said, well, hey, let's see if we can create a line item to make sure that education can get out there. And so, um, of course, this past general set, uh, session we had, it was really short because of some stuff that was going on with the remap. The census play a role in that. So after the census, we do a remap every 10 years. And the census is really important because it um, calculates how much funding comes back to our community. So if we're undercounted, we get less funding. And so that's why it's so important. But it also messes with our, uh, our lines and how we draw our districts. And so representation does matter. And so I represent a district that is very diverse. It's 105,000 constituents, but it's a tale of two cities. There's one part that's very fluent, rich, vibrant. There's another part that has been disinvested for generations, right? And so for me, allocating funding for this program was key. It was really important. And so we are going to have 300, what is it, 300,000? that I allocated um, in order to do this program. And so that's not it. It will be more. Um, this is just the start. And so when we talk about R3, we're talking about, you know, um, preventing gun violence. Like what starts the, the trail of someone even thinking about picking up a gun? Oftentimes it's because we have, you know, young folks at home or people who come from communities where I would like to say, um, you know, poverty is at the key, it's at the root of it. And so in order to tackle that, you have to make sure that people have good quality housing that's affordable, good education, resources that goes into that, mental health access, good health care and access to that that's affordable, and then also making sure that folks are able to walk amongst their streets and not be afraid looking over their shoulders. And so R3 targets all of those things, gun violence um, intervention and prevention, um, youth development. We need a lot of that in North Lawndale. Um, and when I talk about North Lawndale, I'm going to talk about my district in particular, but North Lawndale is key to that. And then also making sure that we have access to mental health services as well. And so I'm a big supporter of this. I think that this is going to be a long term strategy that we have to use and make sure a lot of these uh, smaller 
nonprofit organization have the funding because sometimes I have people come to me and ask for small dollars. They're like, I need, need $100,000. And I'm like, well, how are you going to stack it? How long do you think that $100,000 is going to last? We need more. And so no matter how much money your congressman, your state rep, your alder person, or your senator puts into the district or into your communities, you're not really seeing it because it's been deprived for so long. So it's going to take us real strategic, long-term resources just being pushed intentionally back into our communities to actually see development, economic development and growth and safety. So I don't know if you want me to say anything else. That's a lot. But, but mama's on the move. <laughs> My nanny, you know, he's a little bit under the weather, so he's kind of taking me through some stuff today. But what do you want me to touch? Some more stuff, yeah. or if there's any questions, yeah, take questions. questions. And before you take any questions, I just want to give her a round of applause, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Something that she pushed through at the last minute. Yes. You know, I didn't know. Yes. I, I didn't really know the process. I, I thought I was on time doing stuff in, in April, only to find out I was behind the eight ball. Yeah. <laughs> she said, I don't know if we can do this, but I'll try. So she's been she's been up and at it ever since. So if you have any questions of her concerning R three or anything she just said. And just to speak great. on that really quick before the question. So I was touching it a little bit our this past mm -hmm. session went from January until April because you know the elections had started for our revamps, the state. And normally the session lasts from January until the end of May. Mm -hmm. So I typically ask people to give me your proposals in February because that's just how long it takes to like really push your stuff in. And then you have to follow it all the way through. Um, so it was like kind of last minute, but mm -hmm. again, just really like pushing and pushing. And when we talk about Lawndale, everybody say, oh, we got to make sure that Lawndale, you know, is getting this and that. And then we for, then folks forget about Lawndale. And so being a representative of communities like Lawndale, uh, it's important to make sure we push that through because we're part time legislators. We're not full time. We're part time. A lot of people don't know that. Part so we kind of sort of disappear from January to May and then we come back from May from June until November and then now I'm kind of like going back and forth until session starts again in January. So just in case people don't really know that, but I like to always explain the process because I don't think we get that enough. All right, and then too, before we take questions, she also made sure that not only her district is covered, but several other districts were covered. You know, when I wrote the letter, I wrote to two other or was it, yeah, two other elected officials trying to get them to support this. I never heard back, mm -hmm. but she didn't have any objections to using money from her district to also, you know, spread it around. So we've got North Lawndale, we've got East Garfield, we've got Austin, Humble Park, and Inglewood. And I know your district doesn't cover all of that, right? <laughs> so we're really, really thankful that you you know, unselfishly allowed us to use the funds to stretch yes. it to, to where it's needed. Need a lot more. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Questions? Um, I guess when you say more dollars appropriated, what does that look like? Does it mean expanding the coverage area for the capacity building or? I'm talking about it just in general. Like you'd be surprised what some folks ask for or what they've been getting throughout the years. And so I like to tell people, and what Valerie is doing is important. You learn the process, and that way you're more independent when you're going in for the act. It's only you know how much it'll cost to actually run an effective program, right? And a lot of times, us as black and brown people, we ask for the minimum because we're not used to getting the maximum, mm -hmm. right? But there are other folks out there who always go in for the millions, and they get it, but the part that comes with that is organization and building. And that's something that we're kind of missing in our communities. So we'll ask our elected official, hey, can you do this? But then we don't have the movement behind them. And so they're kind of battling it out on their own. It's 118 of us in the House of Representatives. So you can just imagine if someone says we have $700 million, million you think like, oh, that's a lot of money. Not when you divide it up amongst 118 uh, House members from all across the state. And then when you think about the Senate, because they're all digging in that pot too. 
So depending on seniority, depending on who you know, it you know it can differ in what, how much money you get it. And so my experience, my background has come from organizing and a little bit of push, you know. Not all that, you know I got some church folks up in here. Um, but I would say I strategically was able to kind of maneuver around some of that stuff. But again, when you ask for $150,000 or $200,000, and when I look at the program itself, or if I take a tour, because I like taking tours of who I'm you know, trying to fight for funding for, I always ask, like, that's all you're asking for? Like, how many staff people you have? You probably can use more. Won't you up the funding a little bit more? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say, well, I didn't know. You got to ask for more. You got to get comfortable with asking for more because our communities are deprived all the time or we're always coming in last because we're not asking for more. But then there's a disconnect because we don't have the community behind us a lot of the times when we're asking for that stuff. But that also works both ways. It's our job to educate our community members too on how to do this, how to slip for a bill if it's a bill that we're a supporter of or against. Like you got to think about it. You got people in position of power who are making decisions for you that affect you, right? So you you know you get upset and, up and mad at the person that's representing you, but you have to be able to hold folks accountable. So you got to know who's taking what vote, who's allowing what funding, you know who pushed back on what or who allowed it to happen. You wouldn't know that. So I always like to make sure people know this is my job. This is what I do. This is how you can contact me. And if you don't like something, I will make sure that it, you know, changes or I can make sure this gets done. And that's it. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So what if, you never, what if I never applied for a grant before? Or maybe I have applied for one before, but I didn't get it. Uh, what does the grant look like for me after I apply for it? Like, how does the process work? Because I know that I've been like doing everything out of pocket for a fundraiser. So that's a good question because for me, what I've done, um, anyone who was new that came into, so I've only been in for two years, mind you. So anyone who I identified that has been doing the work for a long time but never got funding, um, I typically tell them the structure of how they need to do their proposal, all of the stuff they need to list in there, and then for me, I push it on my end. Mm -hmm. So there is another process to it. Things happen, technicalities happen. So in the House of Representatives, when it's time to vote on the budget at the end of May, you can see your line item in the bill before you take your vote, because that's the most powerful thing. But then stuff gets switched to the Senate. And if it goes over to the Senate, depending on what their priorities are, it can probably change. And then they send it back. And then it goes into this thing that we called, um, oh my god, I forgot the little fancy word. Anyway, once they send it back to us, if we're the last ones to get it back, it's like final in that moment. And so if you're checking and it says that everything is correct in that line item, you see it, like I saw Valerie's, then we vote on it because we accept it because we see all of our budget items in there, then there's a, a wait time. So if the new fiscal year comes out, which is every July, folks, they normally think that they automatically get the money right away. But there are different agencies that give out this different funding. A lot of people don't know that part. And so sometimes there can be some stall. There has been some stall recently um, with some of our line items. But there is a process. But for new folks, they would approve. If you ask for $5 million, you never got it before, you might not get $5 million. Mm -hmm. You might get less than $5 million because they got to see how you're working with it and check up on it, but I always say, make sure you got a good accountant, you won't go to jail. Uh, but <laughs> typically somebody knew, one organization over here in Lawndale, when I helped him out, um, I think his first line item was like, a little bit under 200,000, and then the second one was 300,000, and then an additional 100 and something thousand in the same year. But that was because he was proven to have used the funds, and they, everything was counted for. So if you have something, you can contact my office. You need a proposal again to me by February because March, April, I'm going to be pushing for my stuff. So that is the next round. Yes, so, but, so 2023, we get sworn back in in January. All right. By May, we'll be voting on the new budget for 2024. So any laws that we make uh, in 2023 goes into effect in 2024. So applications can be submitted in February? 
you can start sending your proposals to me in February. I ask for them in February. Most people come to me at like the end of April saying, hey, can you, I'd be like, I ain't gonna promise you, but I will try. But most of the time it's us trying to find different sources of funding at that point. So if I already know I can talk to my speaker, I can talk to the Senate president, I can talk to who I need to talk to to get those line items in place. So should, um, if we have a like secretary that's not in your You should work with your state rep, but it's not uncommon for folks to go to different reps and ask them, but we have to understand we have priorities of our district. So I can uh, I can present it, but then we'll get hit with it, well, what's your top priority? I'm going to prioritize my district. I'll just be honest with you. So it would be good to work with your state rep, but then we also have a black caucus in the state of Illinois. We can appropriate line items, line items for our caucus as well. And then there's a general revenue fund that you can also go for it too. Yes. And you were saying uh, proposal. Is this, um, are we talking state proposal or just an idea that I come up with for my organization and I want to talk to you about it or are we just talking about state application? So your proposal for your program, how much it'll cost, how much, it, how many staff people you have, mm -hmm. um, what the program does, all the entails okay. and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. When you say three hundred thousand for our three grant, you're saying that's total what your each district can get is three hundred thousand. No, this, this is a pers This is a, a request that Valerie made specifically for the program that she's presenting. <laughs> so whatever you have individually is your own proposal yes. that I'm talking about. So they don't have nothing to do with the <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of money for a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do, do you, sir, and then I'm gonna do you, ma'am. That's cute sweater, too. You got to know we got it from. And I'm gonna do you, sir, after one, two, three. Okay, so you go online where? You don't go online, you contact me. So if you're an organization in North London, wherever in my district, um, you will contact me and you'll tell me, hey, Rep Collins, I have this proposal. Yeah. Or you will contact your state rep, or you can contact the senator, which is Patricia Van Pelt. Right. You can ask her because she has a priority. She has a side too, where yeah. she gives out funding as well. Right. So you don't just stop at the state rep. So me and Omar Williams are the two reps covered under her Senate district. Right. So whatever priorities that she has from her different communities that she represents, she has to present those as well. So I can help to sign a letter to push her to do that priority. There's some funding in the in the Senate, so a lot more funding. I'm sure you have someone. How you like your proposals to nope. I just told you. It's simple. It's just something for me to show them who your organization is, what it entails, how many staff people you plan to staff it up, who is your outreach base. Yeah. Are you reaching out to 150 youth? It's going to take about 10 staff members. This is how much it's going to go into administrative costs. This is how much it is to, you know, um, do the program for this amount of time, whether it's six months, a year, you know. That's it. And what do you all do? Do you get wraparound services? Do you just focus on youth development? Do you focus on mental health only? You know. Yeah. And you know. So this is, I'm assuming like a cohort. So mm -hmm. we'll be learning about structuring grants, leadership mm -hmm. over a period of time. Yeah. This is what the proposal is about. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. the mastermind. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it was you, sir, and then you, ma'am, with the glasses, and then you, you pull up. So my uh, first question is, is the name of the person sitting under the Ben Pelt, she's District 5, so she, so each senator has two state reps. So I'm the state rep for one part of her district, and then Omar Williams is for the other part of the district. Yeah, I think you asked my other question. I'm just asking about uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but you can always talk to me about it in more detail if you want to, but that's just like the general stuff that I'll ask <laughs> folks to put in their proposals for me. Okay. Yeah, and then you, ma'am. Um, so just to piggyback off of what she said, because I'm like brand new to the, to the 
for this program, mm -hmm. so I wanted to know like, what is our story like a unit stamp or something? Mm. Uh, a long name. <laughs> restorative, <laughs> restorative reinvestment, <laughs> renew. So I can, I can tell you how to set it up, what's best for me, but your state rep might have something different on how they want it structured. Okay, so I can tell you, for me, it's just making it as simple as possible. Because when I take your proposal and I go and talk to my speaker, if he asks me, you know, hey, Rep Collins, there's a lot of stuff on this list for folks. What are your main priorities? I can say I need X, Y, and Z. These are the programs. And you can also reach out to the speaker directly and send a letter from your organization on why it's important. You come to Springfield. I tell people all the time, that's important. Come to Springfield. Let legislators see your face. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you're holding them accountable too, right? Mm -hmm. I need you to support my initiative. Do you, do you support this? And oftentimes we hear them say yes. Okay, well, can you sign on to this support letter? Mm -hmm. Right, that's how it works, mm -hmm. you know? The more people that you get to support it, the easier it is when it's time to make a vote. But also just give you another experience too. And then you build relationships with other legislators, the senators, and then you know you don't have to always come to me if you don't want to. You could, it's the best thing to do, but you can always, and it's good to always do that. Because like I said, it's some legislators who have proposals from other folks that come from my district and they're like, hey, Collins, I got this. It was a priority. But can you take one that's priority? And I'd be like, I know I already put out my priorities, but give it to me because it's from my district and it's important to me. Can I ask this question? Let me ask this question. Do I have safety because I already got this clear? Because I have a greatest program that I'm launching in uh, women that have mental health and trauma. Were they from there? It's the organization? Yeah. We, we got mental health money out there, baby. Trauma. Um, trauma. Yeah. 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 Yes, ma'am. You, ma'am, I'm sorry. No problem. Thank you for coming. Um, and as far as the timeline, so if organization were to contact you with a proposal in February, the, we would expect that the program would have to take place in the money spent from July 1st of 2023 to July 1st of 2024. So the fiscal year. It would be the fiscal year. Okay. Yeah. Mm hmm when you say go to Springfield to lobby and talk to legislators or the speaker himself or Senate president himself yeah you could take a group of folks to go down you used to, they open back up the whole chamber and stuff you just go take a trip down there you can sit in the pews you can go to people's office and talk to them you can take a group of people make it a field day you know it's a good experience what's the time frame like towards hours um, for Springfield, mm -hmm. I think we're open. I don't, you know, I don't even know, girl. I know that the session starts. <laughs> <laughs> like, sessions sometimes start at like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, but it'd be people already here at like 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, depending on when it get closer to um, the budget time, that's when it get really crowded and the hours get longer. So this last session in April, we started at 8 a.m. We didn't get out till 6 a.m. the next day. Mm -hmm. So it's serious when it comes to the budget. And the year before that, we didn't get out to like 4.30 a.m. And when I first started, we didn't get out to like 3 a.m. So it just seemed like they just, you know, keep increasing the time for us to be in here. So I hope we get out, you know, 2023 at like midnight, but I doubt it. Because we got some new stuff going on. I'm going to do you, ma'am, and then I'm come back to you. So it's just different. It depends on what pot it's coming from. Because I've seen where, um, and I'll use one example from an organization where the funds were released. Because when you know your funds are about to be released, they start to have these prep conversations with those people in that group. And then there's this last of paperwork you have to do. And oftentimes they just directly give it out. With the R3 funding, um, I think they just, if you're a, competitive mm -hmm. so it's probably a little bit different yeah so it just depends on which line items mm -hmm. everything is different yeah it also depends on like, what um what power you mentioned so most state agencies are on reimbursement um i see joe we just 
And just really quick before I come back to you, love, Sankofa is going to Springfield in March. They're leaving at six. They're coming back at about five in the evening. If you want to go, you can travel with them in March. It's a good experience. And then, you know, because we have a representative here in our district that really is looking out for our community. She's not only just talking about our three. We're also talking about some other bills that she has in, particularly around kinship care and foster care and trying to get more, we're trying to get more money for uh, grandparents who are raising grandchildren for kinship. So in March, we plan to uh, bombard Springfield and, and, and let her know that we're behind her and pushing whatever bill her and she's working with other representatives she does she don't only just work by herself she's she's been a, a like a guru she's been talking to everybody now <laughs> that she's partnering with everybody she thinks that i don't know it we know it, we know it in our district you know because I've, I've been the beneficiary of having an r3 what i wanted to know is can we apply for a second year for it? That I don't know. Do you know? Yeah. She so, should be able to. Yeah. So it's um. Can you come? Oh, right. the mic. The mic. <laughs> I'm usually real loud. Can, can you have a seat? Um, so R three is multi year. We've gone back three times and asked the R three board. So it's the first cycle was three years. This second is going to be three years too. They don't know it yet, but it's going to be three years. <laughs> Tell that we can't tell you because the board has to vote, but it's we're pushing okay. that. Yeah, yeah. That makes it good. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So. And then when the new rounds come out, we usually do have a stipulation that if you are already awarded, you can't apply for the new rounds because you're already in the cycle, and we want to bring in as many new groups as possible. So in 2020. Three, there'll be a 2024 fiscal year, but it'll happen in the spring of 2023. There'll be a new round, and it'll be all new agencies being brought in. Yes, we are pushing for, um, and we have a precedent because we did it with the first round. They're in their third year now, so it'll be real hard for them to tell me no on the next round. So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I just wanted to say last week, um, I'm already know. I know you are. Uh -huh. But what I was going to say is, so I tell people to contact me in February. The end of February will be the deadline. So you can start sending them out as soon as possible if you want to, or set up meetings with my office, and then we can talk in detail about your proposals and what your organizations do. And on the days that I come back, or my chief of staff, Jesus Martinez, who is here, can do a tour with you on what you have going on. And then oftentimes, you know, we just start pushing the stuff through by the end. But I normally like to take my stuff in as a bulk of what I'm doing. Can you give us address? My address? You got my card right there? You ain't, get my, you ain't giving my card? What's going on with you now? 2165 South Millard. So many hands. I'm going to go with you, ma'am. And then I see you back there with the brown hat. And then you start. So a three. about reimbursement so let's assume we already have money mm -hmm. you know and I just wanted to to say hopefully that maybe you and, and, and some of your um, uh, cohorts could work on helping organizations that don't have that upfront money okay you know to even to even apply for grants and and pay them in advance waiting for the reimbursement know. yeah yeah that's 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 a difficult thing for some of us and I also take advice for legislation too.
always a stroke of a pen. My pen, I've been trying to rewrite history with a lot of bills that I've been coming across. So we could talk about that as well because we don't do enough of that either. We don't talk enough about legislation that harms our communities. And so I would love to hear from you all, congressmen too, right? So the policy part is really, really important. So I've been able to um, pass a few bills that folks said I couldn't pass, but it was around DCFS, like Ms. Annette said, I was the ward of the state, well, a youth in care. And so I know all the interworkings of that. I was a nursing home worker, I know all the interworkings of that. So being able to change those two systems is really important to me. And I've already done a lot of the groundwork. I'm looking to do more childcare, personal experience of being a mother of three. So it's a lot more that I'm looking to change, making people upset, but I also have a preservation bill right now to preserve a lot of our legacy homes in North Lawndale. And one of our, one of my constituents, your neighbor here, um, Walanda Cannon, she um, thought of the idea. We wrote the, uh, the language together and that's the bill that I'm presenting. It passed the first um, hearing in the housing committee, which I sit on. So I'm looking to see that all the way through. It would actually give funding to a lot of the folks who have lived in Lawndale for three to six generations <clears throat> to help them with funding to keep up their property. Because oftentimes what we see is that there's a lot of wear and tear. You have city grants, right? But a lot of our seniors don't really know how to navigate around that. And it's just so hard for them to get that funding. So I'm trying to create a structure for the state to do it, put more funding to that. And we're just trying to figure out a formula on how to get that done. But that will save a lot of these homes and it can be passed down to the next generation without them having that burden on them and being forced to seal. So I wanna stop gentrification that way. But there's a number. Oh girl, now you didn't get me. But I can <laughs> get the number, Jesus, and then I'll make sure you have it. But you can find, you can find that bill online right now um, on ilga.gov. That's where you can go see any number of legislation pieces I passed or any of your other representatives, if you're not from here, pass or have waiting to be passed as well. And as far as um, DCFS, I was able to pass a bill where, and I didn't know this, but young folks who parents were like in the military or had parents like mine who had social security money from working, they didn't have that money put to the side for them while they were in the system. The state was actually reimbursing themselves. So we were able to pass the bill to where at 14 they could start saving that money so that when they emancipate, they have a jump start to stability. Mm -hmm. And then becoming a mom while in the system, <clears throat> I found it really hard, a lot of barriers that were blocking me from being successful. So now, Child care covers not only the grandparent now, but it covers the foster parent and the youth in care who becomes pregnant while in the system, mother or father. And so that way when they emancipate out, they get that extra at a year on to where they can look for a job or housing or whatever and have safe, reliable child care while doing so. So there's a lot more, but those are some of the other things. And those ideas come from lived experiences, but it comes from constituents as well. And so I don't know how many other folks have had those experiences, but that is something different I bring to the table and I encourage you to get more involved with me because you may have an idea too you want to get across and we can work on that policy together. ILGA.gov. And then there was a young man in the back. Yes. So you probably will have to connect with another organization out here who share that same interest or you could talk to, you know, one of the experts. Yes. <laughs> yes. Which community are you in on South High? He's like he's from Inglewood. <laughs> oh, he in chat. Okay. My baby. <laughs> I mean, <best> side of town. <laughs> I'm just playing. I said you on the best side of town, but you look like you was from Inglewood, but I just said Chatham, okay, hey. I'm just joking with you.
Oh, yeah, that's so we have and just for all of you all to know, every um, government entity has what we call debriefs, whether you apply for city, county or state. There's usually a time frame where I think it's I don't even know what the state is. Um, I think ours is like two months from the time that you get a de declination letter. And it's usually in that letter. It'll tell you if you want to debrief or if you want to, um, I forget the word, but like challenge it, you have a certain amount of period to do that. So if you reach out to my office, Sharif, hold your hand up. Sharif in the back is our community engagement person. Get his card um, and even though you're past the time period, I'll get you a debrief. Because in that debrief, we go over your score. And you can actually see what, because sometimes it's not that you wrote a bad application, it's the competition in your area, right? Like, for one area, we had maybe like 25 agencies that scored, the top score was 120, right? And at a certain point, we go down, 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 and then we run out of money in that area. So it's not that you wrote a bad proposal, but you'll get that feedback. So if it was a proposal that didn't get a high score, you'll find out what areas they kind of marked you down on and where you can improve. Yeah. <laughs> so I am Nikki Harvey from Congressman Davis's office, and I know most of you all in the room, I do believe. Yeah, I think I do. But a lot of you may not know, I actually sit as the board president for Sankofa, and I am actually one of the directors on the Illinois Black Caucus just as well. So on my way out the door, because I cannot stay, I love your question. And I loved how she broke it down, because all grants are graded, even federal appropriations, everything is graded. So know your statistics and know what's going on in your area. If you don't remember nothing else anybody said here today, remember this. I know that we allow paperwork to be our kryptonite. Remember how Superman couldn't move because of the kryptonite? We allow paperwork to be our kryptonite. You are here today to exhaust kryptonite. NFP, Newtopia, that's what you're here for so you can actually learn how to remove the kryptonite so you can be competitive and continue to serve and do the things that you need. I gotta go. Everybody have a great time. Thank you. you want me to wrap up? Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna be brief, but there's so much, this is like day one you all will be with. Miss Leonard, if you choose to, over a period of time. ICEJA is also developing, you'll hear about it, it's called Eye to Eye Institute to Innovate. Um, it's very similar, we're not in competition, there's plenty of need to go around, but it is a capacity building institute. We must be twin brains here because <laughs> I've been pushing this through and as Rev Collins mentioned, everything is a process. So last year I got GAMBI, which is the Governor's Office of Budget Management, to approve my proposal to actually staff up for um, the institute. So we will have eight um, what we're calling grant coaches. We'll be bringing in cohorts of 20 organizations that have never been funded or who have applied and been denied. And we'll do, we keep doing 20 every six months um, as we go through this list. So in January, the first cohort is gonna go through and then six months rounds. Um, we will release what we can. So there's gonna be, it's called a request for information. When you see it in everybody, I'm gonna just send it to um, Valerie so she can distribute it to her networks. Um, when you get that RFI, it's literally like maybe, I don't know, 10 to 12 questions. It's not an application for a proposal. It's just asking a little bit about your organization. We take everybody who responded to the RFI and put you on the list. And then we reach back out to you and say, hey, we're having our next cohort. Are you interested? This is what it's gonna require because there is some time investment. My goal is that everyone who goes through the institute, we then can onboard them to a small grant. And when I say small, $100,000 is small. Right, because we get out, I see just, when I came from the county, I was like, $100,000 a lot of money. At the, at the state, we get out so much money, $100,000 seems really small, so to Rep Collins' point. And I just wanna make one more point about R3. R3 is, has never been done before. If you all have been applying or looking at grants, you will have experience that most of the time they ask you to have three years experience. 
our three were taking brand new, you could be in the kitchen of you know grandma and auntie and say, hey, we want to do a mentoring program. You can apply for all three. You will not be disqualified. Our three is taken on the ground, grassroots organizations. For the first time, we kind of put everybody in tears. And we put 75% of the money into organizations that are $2 million or below, so that you do not have to compete with the um, larger, more established organizations. You compete against each other. So we think that's going to help make things more equitable, where you know grassroots, and, and there are three tiers. So two million is 75 percent of the money but there's a group that's like 500 or below and then two million to 500 and then the larger one um, and if you all think of other things that as you're applying that you say you know this because when i came to the state i was like you need a phd and i'm a <laughs> grand writer i've been writing grants for 20 years right if you experience things and you're like this is crazy this is a burden this is really making it difficult like, please reach out to my office, because that's what we're doing. We're leaning in, we've had some listening tours. We made a whole lot of changes in round two based on people's feedback from round one. Um, so, you know, definitely share that with um, Valerie as you all are going through this process. Her goal is to ready anybody who wants to be ready for the application. Also, if you go on ICJA, I-C-J-I-A, that the website we have a tutorial it's called recipe for grant making it's like nine modules and you can skip around but it actually because some people ask about the, the framework for the proposal it actually gives you technical assistance on what's the best and most um, best practice for grant writing um, so we have that available and then we have a lot of things on our YouTube channel so a part of the Institute is going to be making those things available for the general public, but actually really taking um, smaller grassroots localized community organizations through this sort of supportive process. I C J I A. Is dot gov. And then R3 has a website as well. So just a couple of things to clear up. When Rep Collins was talking about a line item appropriation, that is not our three. Um, the uh, Black Caucus has violence prevention line items. It's about 16 million that comes through ICJ. So that funding, she, you know, legislators can actually name organizations for that funding. Our three is completely competitive meaning we released a notice of funding opportunities you have to apply through the state's process the difference between a line item and i just want to share this with you because agencies are not told this is only one difference you don't have to respond to the notice of funding opportunity meaning you don't have to kind of write it out but everything else is the same meaning you still have to get a state contract so you do have to have your scope of work and your budget kind of in place. And the longer it takes you to get that budget approved through whether it's ICJ or DHS, the longer it takes your contract to get executed. No money exchanges without a contract. So whether you get named by a legislator or you get awarded because you responded to a NOFO and, and was selected, you still have to go through that contract process and with the state, it can take up to three months. I always suggest that people, if you have programs running, you mentioned that you're running your programs out of pocket and you want to continue to do that, you do that because you can get reimbursed starting at your contract start date and usually it's July 1. If you are new, a lot of times that contract start date is the date I or whatever other executive director signs it. So why is that important? Because if I sign it August 18th and you started work July 1, you're not going to get paid from July 1 to August 18th. So be very clear, ask questions, and say, when is this contract going to start? Because a lot of times what happens, we start you know, hiring people, and we get excited, and we're doing the work, and we're like, just hold off, because we've been what? We've been operating these programs on the gift of the prayer anyway, telling folks, you're going to get paid. You're going to get paid. You're going to do a fundraiser. So we're used to operating without 
And then we get this contract and we, we start giving people salaries and we start doing the official kind of higher up and then we find ourselves in a bind. So just ask questions about that and be very intentional about when your contract starts. And then as I mentioned, um, our agency has the working capital advance play. Apply. Can you believe people do not apply for it? For what? Advanced pay, because it's, it's a separate step. Advanced. Advanced pay or working capital. That helps you get the two months up front of operating costs yeah. while you're doing the reimbursement. It's still going to go to reimbursement because that's the state rule. So talk to your rep when she talked about legislation. That everybody should be writing letters saying, look, the state reimbursement is antiquated and inequitable. It does not work for on boots on the ground grassroots organizations who don't have cash flow. You can be a big organization. If you don't have cash flow, you don't have cash flow. Mm-hmm. Right? So be in that ear and say, look, we want to take a look at this. It's called gather the government. Um, what is it? Uh, accountability Government Accountability Technical Assistance Act. And that's what all of our grants, GATA, all of our grants are governed by that. And the state mirrors the feds, they don't have to. So where you see things are feeling a little punitive and kind of tough for you all, raise it. Because they might just be like, oh, we do it because this is how the feds do it. We don't have to mirror the feds all the time. Because the feds, you think the state is harsh. The feds, oof. Anybody have federal grant? It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna take her. This is really because I want to be clear. I am, um, I'm really advocating my our CEO. I'm like, I don't want to deal with this because we get funded and it's a reimbursed yet, and it's like three months sometimes. And she's going to credit cards, trying to pay staff. So I'm trying to push and do this argument again. So that's why I make it feel a lot better. Yes, the competition. And just so I add this if you're not, um, you can choose if you want to be quarterly or monthly. A lot of people choose quarterly because they think the reports every month is a burden, but then you get reimbursed every month. So it's a trade-off. So I always say if you're smaller and you're kind of strapped for cash, do the monthly reports and, and just staff yourself up in a way that you have somebody to help you to get those reports in monthly because you'll get reimbursed monthly. I see you have a agreement with the Comptroller's Office. If it's a violence prevention program, you'll be prioritized. Um, because you know that translates to safer public safety measures and reducing violence prevention, and so we see that as a priority. The Lieutenant Governor's Office actually fought for that task. Hi, I'm Shadi Jones. Sorry, I'm coming in. I talking about there are lots of other opportunities it's spelled out in the Arthur notice of funding opportunities read like read all between the lines there are certain like requirements the beauty of R3 is you don't have to be a nonprofit so you can apply as a nonprofit 5123 as a business as a community group it is very broad so in terms of your question you would pick the structure that it's that it's that it's best, best for you in terms of how you're gonna it still has to be a service providing entity meaning if you're doing catering it's r3 is not going to kind of pay for you to do free catering like if you wanted to do a workforce component it still has to be a service that falls under the five pillars of r3 which is economic development youth development violence prevention re-entry and civil legal aid so thinking about how you would shape your program to fit into one of those priority areas and what service would you be providing 
um, then that might determine all of the other things that we are talking about in terms of the insurance and things. Like Which would be the mission? Yeah. I just want to know if you have any cards. I do, and I'll get those. I'll get those before I leave. All the way in the back. Right here. You said on the website that there was a module that we could go. Mm -hmm. Where can I find that on the website? Yes. If you type in um, recipe, am I saying it right, Sheree? Um, recipe for grant making. <coughs> you. It, mm -hmm, if you search it, it should pop up. It's like a little little whole little thing where they use food and the recipe. To teach you all about grant writing. That's cute. It is real cute. One of my staff created it. So, very happy about that. Um, let me make sure I cover everything that my people told me I need to cover. Oh, equity scorecard. Okay, so in R3, and this is really important because we took a lot of time thinking about how to make R3 equitable and put this in, but people still kind of overshadow it and don't take it as serious. You get 30 points for three questions. One, if you are a organization that has leadership that reflects your community. If you are an organization that has staff and like credible practitioners, that reflect the community that you're going to be served. And then the other 10 points, um, I can't think of off the top of my head, but it's, it's centered in kind of the same thing. Don't just say yes. <laughs> Don't just be like, yes, and move on. Say yes and explain how your organization reflects that community because you're getting a weighted, it's up to 10 points. So you can get an additional 30 points. Why that's important? because I purposely made it weighted because I am an equity fellow. So I know how to do equity, right? When I first came, I see just like R3 is an equitable grant maker. And we, did, we didn't hit the mark. We didn't get as many organizations in those targeted black and brown communities that we wanted to. And they were like, well, what, what was wrong? We said equity, we told people it was equitable. I said, because equity is intentional. You have to have things in there that actually lead to that outcome. So the way we have it structured, not only can you get an extra 30 points, so there's 100 traditional points and 30 equity points. If you and another agency get the same score, let's just say you both get 100, but you got 30 equity points, you get a priority. Right, so I'm down to the last group and I got two agencies, I could take one and you both got 100. I'm going to take the one with the highest equity score. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Within the hundreds. That equity is the leadership staff and what else? You have leadership that staff. reflects the community. Right. You have service providers and practitioners. And our, our, it's actually on the R3 website. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm right. having a little brain fart here. But okay. it's, it's three different questions that really dig deep and make sure that you all, meaning reflective of the communities most harmed by the war on drugs yeah. are getting a priority through a weighted score. Um, so, oh, you asked a really good question and I'll take you to it. So one of the questions you asked was, was it a lottery? R3 is a review process, but it's reviewed by community members. So you all will see, and I encourage you, review. And the reason I encourage you to review is because you get to read other people's proposals. And then you get to learn, okay, this is how people are writing. You get to learn how we score, because you have a scoring rubric. And you can review outside. You can review in your community if you apply. But you can volunteer to review in Inglewood or, you know, I don't know, up north or somewhere. But it's such a good learning opportunity. But the beauty of our three is that peers in North Longdale, Austin, are going to be reviewing. And they're going to be able to say, hey, we need this program in our community. This is a better program. And they're going to score kind of according to their lived experience, but then also what you articulate as your program and your outcome. Will you get the outcome back? Say if you don't get it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take this gentleman, but just really quickly. I mentioned um, before with the young lady's question, you can ask for a degree. Um, if you're not selected, you can immediately, like on that declination letter, it'll tell you who to email and ask for a review of your application so you can learn 
where, where it was going to fail in comparison to other groups. Yeah, tell me, is there any, uh, say, more advantage or weighted calculation or review if it is a single organization versus a collaboration? Great question. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the same questions, it's the same kind of scoring rubric on that no fold for R3. It'll tell you what everything is weighted. It'll say the finances is five points, you know, your narrative is 10. Pay attention to those scores, right? Because sometimes our capacity is limited and we're writing, I know this, I'm a grant writer, we're writing to the last minute, right? And some sections are going to be nice and robust and some we like, oh shoot, I got an hour. Look at what's weighted mostly and spend your time there. Budgets, we don't tell your budget apart anyway, so just have a budget that makes sense. Meaning, don't pay your executive director $300,000 and your, <laughs> your practitioner twenty, <laughs> right? Because right. the reviewer is going to mark you low on that. Just do your budget good enough that it makes sense and it tells the reviewer that like you thought about it and you, you have a budget that is going to go mainly towards your program with um, reasonable costs to everything else. Don't shortchange yourself. Ask for indirect costs. A lot of small organizations think they can't get it. I know 10% is the minimum that you can get unless you have a federal allocation. I'm encouraging people, once you get established, go through that process because once you get a federal allocation, you can get more in your indirect cost, but your indirect cost is how you pay for your audits, it's how you pay for like a lot of your mm -hmm. overhead. Mm -hmm. and, and I think historically people frowned on that and nonprofits suffer. Mm -hmm. Like you literally were operating for free. I right. tell people don't work for free. The state doesn't work for free. Well, we take 10%. It's a recipe for failure. It so, is that's... an absolute recipe for failure, yeah. but we've been doing it for 100 years. So mm -hmm. people are trained to say, well, if I have my budget is so low, I'm gonna just skip the indirect or I'm gonna do 2%. Do your indirect first because that's what's gonna help you operate, have good staff to do your reports and really give you the capacity to have a business. Again, mm -hmm. this is a business. Mm -hmm. I heard you mention uh, you by community and peer. Can you Yes, so if you go to our three website right about now, there's a link and you can sign up to be a reviewer. It's got a little description of what it is. So that's one huge part of our three that's different. Every other grant that I see you has, we is reviewed by either um, internal staff or other state staff. R3 is the only one where community members volunteer. We have over 400 reviewers that are signed up and you get a little gift card. But most importantly, we're hoping that community can read the proposals and say, oh wait, we, we don't need another, I mean, I hope nobody has a boxing club, but we don't need another boxing club. We need A, B, C, and D. And as you're reviewing, you're coming in from a lens of I live here, I know what the need is. I'm sorry, the so camera. Of, of, those, thank you. of those who are community reviewers, what percentage do they make up of the total reviewers and those who have a private say? So for our three, they make up 95%. And the only reason they don't make up 100 is because I always lose them in the end and I have to like pull staff or other state agencies in and say, look, I lost these three, can you review? But the goal is 100%, but just because of, you know, life happens and people have to um, kind of check out, it's, we've been traditionally about 95%. Yeah. 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 Is it after we submit or after I will submit my proposal to see what has been done in the past when I see it now for what previous? So again, because it's a time limit, if you reached out to the email, they're going to tell you you missed the deadline to get it reviewed. That's what I'm saying. If you reach out to me. No, no, I'm saying as far as what other people have done who received it. Oh, who received and it before? Um, so if the county. I tell people if you got a restorative justice or violence prevention, the county posts their applications public. 
And I, I'm sharing that with you because it's a learning. You can actually pull organizations' applications and read them and get an idea of who was awarded. The state, because we have so many, I have like over 800 awarded. We don't post it in that way, but there's something called a FOIA, which is a Freedom of Information, and yes. you can always request to look at, I mean, it's your right to see them and use it as a learning. Thank you. Right. So I'm gonna um, leave my cards with Valerie and whoever wants to, you know, continue the conversation or share any, you know, important feedback. We welcome it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And hopefully, you'll see her again at graduation. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So thanks again. We want to thank Del Reese Adams. Um, if you don't remember, she is the executive director of ICEJA. All right, and we also had State Rep Collins who made this program possible. And without further ado, we're going to get into the description of our specific program. The reason, you know, just before we start, but the reason why we're focusing on R3 is again because we realized going through that process some of the serious challenges people had were navigating that amplifying technology and you know other times people had issues with time management and all of that good stuff and being the person that I am focusing on capacity building yeah you know, I thought that we would combine the elements of a program that I do for capacity building, which takes you through 14 different workshops on everything that you need to know to effectively run an organization. So combining that with lessons learned from R3, lessons learned the hard way, all right? Combine all of that to create a program where you're learning that and we're holding your hand along the way and I'm not going to steal people's thunder. Without further ado, we're going to hear from Cecile DeMello. She's going to introduce herself. And she's going to give you a little background on the people who are in the room. We collected the data, you know, as you were filling out the Google form. Keep going. OK. <laughs> All righty. So um, if you recall, you filled out a Google form to just talk a little bit about your experiences, tell us who you are, what community you work in, and all of that good stuff. So we're going to share with you a little bit about that. And then we will also get to a point, um, Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So, um, still is getting ready for that. But just so you understand the distinction, too, um, you heard two distinctions one between the R3 program and the direct appropriation. There's yet another distinction, right? So, the direct appropriation that is for any idea that you may have that you want to talk to your elected official about, right? So, we heard about that. <coughs> the R3 program is specifically for programs dealing with reentry, um, anti violence, et cetera, et cetera. And the specific program that we're doing, right, the funding is from a direct appropriation, but it's not through R3. What we're going to do is make sure that you have the tools that you need to um, improve your leadership, increase your chances of getting an R3 grant, and most importantly, whether you get that R3 grant or not, you will walk away with a stronger organization. So, um, I, I have to up my okay. <laughs> It's hard to cut them off. 
So what I'm going to share won't be no slides. I'm actually going to freestyle it. So you'll just have to look at my medium looking face. Um, so my name is Cecile. Like Valerie was saying, I've been working with Valerie for a long time. Um, and I'm currently the executive director of a community group called Teamwork Inglewood in Inglewood on 63rd and Halstead. Uh, teamwork, I've been there for the last three years. Before that, I was at Blocks Together with Gato on, in West Humble Park. I was there for almost 13 years. <laughs> I know I look like a baby, but if you came up close, you'll see all the grays. Um, so I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> <laughs> teamwork Inglewood um, does violence prevention work. Um, so we do it in a couple of ways. We do after school support for high risk youth and, and enrichment programming for them in the summer. And then we also do returning citizen work. So we do expungement and sealing for residents, as well as job training and placement for residents. And so we were, uh, we have applied for county funds, uh, state funds, city of Chicago funds, and then private foundation funds. So right now I have a mixture of all of those things. Um, but I too heard a lot from the executive director trying to crack the R3 code because I've been trying to crack the R3 code too. So we're going to be learning together. <laughs> um, so you all kind of filled out a little bit of information about who you were before today. And so actually all of us who are being facilitators during this initiative, we've been researching you all as well to see how we can best be able to provide the information that supports you. So, of course, we have a good mixture of those communities who have been the most impacted or qualified the most for R3. So about 39% of you all are from North Lawndale, East Garfield Park. Raise your hand if that's where you're from, that's home. Okay. Uh, the second highest at 31%, or well, it's actually tied, 31% goes to Austin. We got folks doing work in Austin. Hey. All right, another 31% is from Inglewood. Oh, there we go, my family, my tribe. Um, and then about 13.5% is from Humble Park. We got any Humble Park folks here? In our hearts, we are here. <laughs> And so clearly from the questions from the executive director, a lot of us, this is going to be our first time for R3. So understand you're not alone in this initiative. 88% actually um, have never applied for R3. But then we've got some seniors here. We've got 11% of you all in the room who actually have applied for R3. I know sis right here, she had all the questions. Mm -hmm. My questions were your questions. <laughs> Um, and then if you did apply for R3 funding before, were you successful in receiving funding? We only got about 4% um, of those who applied to be a part of this initiative that have received funding, which is why we're doing this, right? To make sure that we have more local grassroots groups who are part of the, convert, uh, a part of the funding for the future. If you've received funding, R3 funding before, what was your organization's grant amount? And since not a lot of people applied for this, actually it was Whatever they did apply, they only got 50% is what our, our, our chart said. So you applied for that total, but you probably only got 50%. And as you heard from the ED, that's kind of common, where if it's your very first time applying, you may not get that max amount. Got to impress them that freshman year, and then that sophomore year, you can get some more funding. Um, and then I'll go to, um, so the majority of you all, 94% are committed to being a part of the initiative moving forward. So Valerie's going to talk a little bit about We'll have some, some immediate conversations and work that we'll be doing together, and then we'll have to kind of look at 2023 and work with you all on how that looks. Um, and then majority of you all got permission from your board chair to be here, 95%. The other 5%, I won't tell. <laughs> All right, so that tells a little bit about the, the uh, who's in the room and how we're all on this journey together. I'm going to switch it over now. Who comes after me? Okay, back to Valerie. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Cecile. Am I? Oh. Which? Oh, okay. All right. I was trying to figure out which computer I'm supposed to be on. All right, so we already heard a little bit about the R3 program. 
right? And I'm supposed to manipulate this so that Keith can hear me. Keith, can yeah. you hear me okay? <laughs> can the people in the back of the room hear me okay? All right. All right, so you already know that um, this program is the result of a direct appropriation through the generosity of Representative Lakeisha Collins, right? And your eligibility. We got some real, real strict rules as to who can be in this program. You have to want to do the work. I think that's probably the hardest part, right? You have to serve in one of the um, chosen communities and we're focusing on North Lawndale and East Garfield, kind of looking at them as one community because, you know, we, we kind of bleed off one another. And, and I didn't mean that in a literal sense. Oh, Very poor, poor use of words. Uh, we blend together. We don't realize. <laughs> yeah, that's much better. This is not the time to be talking about bleeding, right? <laughs> we blend together. Our, our boundaries are disappearing, you know. I think I'm the only one who pays attention to those community area maps. But, but at any rate, since we blend together so well, we're going to be focusing on Lawndale and East Garfield together, and I'll be your instructor. And then we will also focus on Inglewood, and Cecile will be your instructor for Inglewood. Um, Humboldt Park, Cato, who you'll hear from very shortly, Cato. Gaite, she will be your fearless leader, and I do mean fearless leader and instructor for Humboldt Park. Uh, and Tina Augustus, um, whom many of you already know, she will be your fearless leader for Austin. And, <laughs> and what, what I love about this program, we all come to this, I guess, with, with a focus on community. We all live, eat, drink, and breathe our communities. Um, but at the same time, we all kind of know these little theoretical frameworks. And what our goal is to do is to break down the walls of all that theory, which is important, right? But also make sure that you can create programs that are what we call evidence-based. Basically, make sure you do something that works. All right, now this is also um, a difficult part too. This is, not, this is not an easy program, but it's not rocket science either. We realize that we're probably asking more of you than most people would ask for a program that you're not paying for. You know, I, I teach at the college level, and I would definitely compare some of the content to the stuff that I teach at the college level. And why is that? Because I don't know no better. I never taught at a lower level. <laughs> so, so you have, I guess, a curse and a blessing of working with us, working through some stuff that is I think really high level, but at the same time, it'll be really relevant to the community. Uh, all right, so we're asking that you attend 80% of the workshops. So there are 16 different workshops. There are 16 three-hour workshops, right, once a week. And we'll talk a little bit more about the schedule later. but. We want you to be able to attend 80% of those. Uh, we will want you to complete a pretest so that we know what your baseline knowledge is. And don't be ashamed if, if all you have is zeros, if you, know, if you feel like you're a blank slate. And it's not a test where any question is right or wrong. You're basically answering questions that let us know what you think is your knowledge level of certain things. And that's important, right? Because we want to be able to know that as you're going through this program and when you're done, that you have learned something. So you're gonna answer the same questions at the end, right? And then we're gonna look at you know, what the difference is. And again, it's no right or wrong, it's just how you perceive 
what you know about these different uh, topics. Um, we will also ask you to complete an evaluation because much as I'd like to think I'm perfect, <laughs> I'm not. So, so we'll look through our eyes uh, between our fingers and see what you really think about us. It'll be an evaluation that you don't have to put your name to. Um, and then we want you to do an organizational assessment. So we want you to take an honest look of, at your organization from the top down. And that's not going to happen until after you go through these workshops because you're not going to really know what to look for until after you go through these workshops. So you'll be looking at things like your leadership and board, um, your financial operation, how well you do with program development, blah, blah, blah. And then <laughs> you laughed a little bit too hard on the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, so, so, uh, so once you do that, you are going to also look at your own leadership skills. You'll look at your skills, and that's going to be a self-assessment too. For those of you who are really brave, you can give the assessment to your boss and to your underlings and see what they think. But, you know, if that was me, I'd just keep it to myself. <laughs> see, you know, just see where you are with your own leadership skills and then look at your leadership style. You know, what are your, what's your preferred environment? And given all of that stuff, we're going to ask you to write an individual leadership plan that is your, prof your professional goals and objectives within the context of looking at your own organization. You know, what does my organization need? What do I need? And how does what I need fit into what the organization needs? And how can I help myself while helping the organization? So that, in a nutshell, is what you'll be doing. And then um, the reason why you're coming here, you want to actually do a capstone project. Your capstone or your graduation project is going to be putting together an R3 program of your choice. So it could fit one of any of those um, different segments, right? You're going to do that program and you're going to present it to the group. And if we can figure out how to, uh, to work on the state system where we're not hurting anybody while we're doing it, we're going to ask you to input that information into the system, right? So you're getting practice developing a program that works within the R3, but you're also getting practice learning how to use their computer system, you know, which is one of the things that we have. So. I'll put myself in the we that we have problems with as well. So if you're committed to giving me your firstborn that I just listed, then you're eligible <laughs> to be a part of this program. And just so you know, this program is free, right? It's, it's not free, but it's free. It's not costing you anything, but I don't want you to not value it, right? I'm hoping and praying to God that this is valuable. And when I define value, I'm looking at something that's going to help you achieve your professional goals, right? And for your organization, it's also gonna minimize your pain. And God knows this is a painful process. So we wanna minimize some of that pain. You, you laughing too hard, <laughs> Ms. Wilson. You sound like you got stirrings. So, and then it's also going to, yeah, I, I do too. That, that's really what drove me to do this. I, I, really, I had such a hard time the first time around. I said, nobody should have to go through what I went through. So that was what is driving um, the development of this program. So um, helping people, you know, and I know I'm not the only one. So, um, and then making your life easier. So that's how I'm defining value, you know. So if we have accomplished those three things, whether you pay for it or not, you have value. All right, Tato, am I, I'm, I think. Just, yeah, just go through, we could just go through maybe that paper. 
Okay. Okay. Um, not along the way. At, at the end. Okay. Okay. Um, Tina's gonna do that. Okay. All right. Okay. You think that's fine? Yeah. All right. And I, I'll I'll send you guys the slides. We are running behind behind time, right? But I, I thought it was important to listen to our elected officials, yeah, yeah. listen to the RJ person, because I mean, our three person, because we don't have that opportunity all the time. And I thank God for them and that opportunity. So I'll just send you um, what, what that's about. So basically the program is workshops, coaching, you know, you're not gonna be on your own, um, workshop, coaching, leadership development, doing that blueprint for sustainability. All right, so I think, uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, the, the topics, let me, let me just share with you the topics. Um, we're gonna give you an overview of the R3 program, leadership development, developing effective boards, a community needs assessment and theory of change. And don't and don't be scared if this sounds like different language. We're bilingual. We're gonna break it down to you. Okay. So uh, program development, yeah, policy policy advocacy, collaboration and collective impact, budgeting and cash flows, fundraising fundamentals, proposal writing. Introduction to Ample Fund, Marketing and Communications, Evaluation Planning, Technology, and Compliance. So, so that's what the program is in a nutshell. So we really want to, I keep thinking of all these gory terms. I start to say, we really want to cut your heads open and pour knowledge. So, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. So we really want to impart knowledge based on our experiences, based on our hardships, and all of that good stuff. So by the end of this program, if you never get an R3 dollar, you'll be armed, oh, armed and dangerous. <laughs> I, I better stop. Yes, what <laughs> you will be powerful. Yeah. You'll be powerful. All right. And, and the good thing is you're going to have workbooks and all that stuff to um, go through. Okay, Pato's going to introduce herself and then we'll hear from Tina and she'll take us home. Okay, uh, I'll be short. Good afternoon. I think it is good afternoon. I'm Caro. Um, blocks together. I'm a resident of the West Side. First lived on South Lawndale. Now I live in North Lawndale. But been at Blocks together for 16 years. Time for me to go. Martin was a youth organizer <laughs> when I started there. Um, primarily, our focus of work um, has been community organizing. We, prior to even us applying for government funding before, our board was very clear that we would not do any government funding because we didn't want to be beholden. So, because we kind of pushed um, a little. And that's what we're known for, for pushing. Uh, we're a little, <laughs> we're, uh, like said, we're a little organization on Chicago Avenue. And um, we were, you know, primarily we're doing economic development, education, and youth. Uh, but through our work, um, what we kept on seeing was of the root problem of all the things we were experiencing was uh, this collective and individual trauma that our community uh, was facing and has been facing. Poverty being one of uh, the main, you know, poverty is very traumatic. The things that, because of poverty, the things that you're led to do to survive, addiction, a reentry. Um, the deep, you know, not investing in our community, the school closures. We were big on fighting against the school closures, uh, passing the facility bills. We may go back and forth. Um, so we've been known really for being like community organizing, uh, pushing to change um, what we don't like. So about we were realizing that a lot of the funding from the private foundations was being exhausted and that all this money was coming. And we're like, wait, wait a minute, the people that are underground, the people that are directly impacted by these funds are not getting it, right? So we we applied for 3R, we did a coalition, we thought we were like, we got this. We had all, all the areas covered, right? We had a badass, we had a bad proposal. <laughs> right, so we were ready to go and we come back and we were like, yeah. and there was people on our team that, you know, lobbied to pass 
the legalization of marijuana and all this. And we were like, okay, we got it. We're here. We got people that have been convicted. We were, we followed all the steps. Everything. Yeah. Nah. So, uh, but then we did just finally get a county grant. So I'm also like, a big county grant, yeah. <laughs> we needed it. Uh, so this is also changing, but also within this, I already told them, because where we're starting, um, and I'm really excited, we're starting the Matula Shakur Detox Center, where we're gonna be using Acu Detox instead of methadone uh, to address uh, the addiction. Because working with children, we saw that one of the main things is home, right? So we can't try to you know, build children um, if the home in our community is also, experiencing trauma, yeah, right. right? So for us, it was really, how do we address the collective trauma and individual trauma? So incarceration, all of that stuff, you know, as a lot of it has been rooted uh, in addiction. And if you go down Chicago Avenue, there's beautiful people, because when they're not on, they're sweeping the, you know, they're part of our organization. I would say like 70% of our members are addicted to something or other, mm -hmm. right? So we, that's what for us, it was a priority. And then also opening up the Participatory Defense Committee which we already know both. So when they were talking, I'm already thinking of like bills because it's actually uh, illegal to use a deto uh, the acupuncture to do detox. Oh, really? Guess yeah. who's against it? The pharmaceuticals, right? Yeah. Oh, right. Methadone yeah. takes it from one drug dealer to the next. Yeah. But that, so, yeah. we, so what we're saying is there's money, but we can change it. At least that's been us. Like, okay, you got this money. That's in the way. How do we move it, right? How do we get this? How do we begin already to tell people, show the impact? Right, so um, I'm no expert, but we've been doing this for a long time. What I am is I'm defiant, and I will try and try and try. And uh, I can know how to make a dollar out of 15 cents. Because we had to make a dollar sometimes out of 10 cents. And worked without getting paid, but it, it, like, it's really our community's our vocation. It's something that I wake up excited, like, who do we gotta mess with today to get what we need? Um, and I think, you know, I think that hunger and the value was always been real crucial to us when we started in really mentoring us and around the work around the TIFs. Um, but anyways, that's also, what I bring is more of that, like, yeah, I'm gonna take that money, but how are we gonna make sure that it's really serving our community? Uh, because sometimes we don't see the money flow, right? There's beautiful theoretical ideas and they've taken on our language, but then it's those million dollar organizations that don't even know the people in the neighborhood, that don't know the name of the guy in the corner, that don't know what's going on. So that's what we're trying to show that we could do it because we know our community better than anybody else. We don't need somebody else to come and analyze us and tell us this is what you need. Wow. All right, Tina. Okay, bring us home. Woo, how could I uh, come behind all these wonderful, phenomenal women? <laughs> ah, so I'm going to take you all home. And I'm going to share with you, first I'm going to share a little bit about myself uh, for those who do not know me, and then I'm going to share the next steps. So I'm Tina Augustus. I'm a business owner um, of Elevate Services. It's a marketing and communications company. I'm also uh, the head of Chicago West Side Chamber. I've, I'm a resident of Austin, but I was born in, um, in uh, North London. So this is like my first home. <laughs> Uh, I've served on boards, I've uh, helped establish businesses, nonprofit organizations. That huge school that sits right here behind uh, this building, I served on the board. They raised millions of dollars to build that infrastructure. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I'm accustomed to seeing uh, the greatness uh, in this community. I'm accustomed to seeing the not so great situations <laughs> in, in this community. Uh, I've had friends and families uh, who've lost their lives to, to, uh, to, to overdose, uh, dear friends. Um, and I've seen those, you know, become very successful and move on and overcome the drug scene. So, um, so the R3 is like a blessing to me uh, coming into our community. And it's our way to, to, you know, come together and be able to give back to our community, those who are able to apply for the funding, those who are able to help you all, you know, access the funding. And so um, I guess I could stop there and then uh, share with you uh, the next step. So we have a letter that we would like for you all to sign. And this is, this is to show our, our support. Who knows that 
uh, our vote counts, and when we vote, things happen, right? right. And when we sign letters, things happen. Absolutely. So we have a support letter uh, that we would like for you all to uh, sign today. And I'll kind of just read through it quickly. And it's to uh, our representative Collins, because she has to have something that she could take to her counterparts to let them know, hey, all these people are standing behind me. And uh, so when she go and ask for more money, she'll have evidence as far as who is asking for this. And so it says, no, you don't have to be. Mm -hmm. And I, I think she had mentioned that, that you don't have to live or be in her district or your organization doesn't have to be in her district, but she has to prioritize and, and handle those people or organizations first. And then, so the money that is coming through her district, but she's serving uh, Inglewood, she's serving Humble Park, Austin, uh, North Lundale, and East Garfield Park. So it says, Dear Representative Collins, we, the undersigned, want to take this time to thank you for your generous support of the R3 Capacity Building and Beyond program to run intensive training cohorts in four high-need need communities, including North Lawndale, East Garfield, Austin, Humble Park, and Inglewood. We are very excited for the opportunity to work with our peers and learn how to use proven methods to create R3 programs build our leadership skills and increase organizational capacity. It is not every day that a program like this is offered in our community for grassroots organizations. We will be participating in three workshops between now and December 17, and then break for the holidays. The date of our return depends on when the legislator releases the funds that they have already set aside for the program. We understand that an era in the appropriations bill passed last spring keeps DCEO staff from starting the funding process. We regretfully request that, you're, that you utilize, did I say something? You said regretfully. Oh, I said we regret. Yeah. Oh, we understand. Is that where I'm, I'm okay, we understand that an era, sorry. <laughs> We understand that an error in the appropriations bill passed last spring keeps DCO staff from starting the funding process. We respectfully request that you, that's the word, respectfully. I don't know why. I, I, <laughs> we respectfully request that you utilize the required legislative processes to formally ask the General Assembly to open the budget during their special session this week and make the necessary corrections to release the funds. We would like to continue our program without interruption beyond the holiday break. Your assistance in this matter is appreciated. We thank you for your time and consideration. Questions regarding the R3 Capacity Building and Beyond program may be directed to Valerie F. Lennon, founder of Nonprofit Utopia LLC, and then her email address, and you'll get to see it. We look forward to hearing from you soon. So, I hope you heard the words that I said and not the mistake, but there was an error that had occurred uh, while um, the application was being processed in the system. It wasn't on, uh, on our end or Valerie's end, but someone kind of hit the wrong letters or whatever and it was directed in the wrong direction. So. We, so we have to go back to get that corrected. It, you, we can't just say, hey, here's a mistake, and then they just go in and push a button. So it has to go back uh, through appropriations, and then they have to correct it before it can be allocated to the right parties. And so the next thing that I need to share with you, it's just these two things, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we passed out a schedule according to our communities and so if you look for Austin, those who will be attending uh, the Austin um, cohort, the workshop will take place at the Austin Public Library, which is right behind the Austin Town Hall. If you know where that library, we have some more. Mm -hmm. We have some more. And then North Lawndale and East Garfield will take place right here at Sankofa. Inglewood would take place at Team Inglewood, which is 815 West 63rd Street. 
And then Humble Park would take place at Blocks Together, 3711 West Chicago Avenue. And so then the last, so we have all of the dates. Uh, we have three sessions at each location. And then um, after they come back for the set, well, based on this letter here that if we get, um, if everything goes our way, then the, then we could continue on with our training sessions and we will provide you with the the, uh, the rest of the calendar for next year. Question? Yeah, we did talk about that, and yes, you could definitely go to, to yeah, as long as you did the right, right, workshop, right. And then in 2023, we will we will hold some of our sessions together. For example, the grant writing session will be held on a Saturday. It will be an all day session for eight hours, and we're going to be uh, we're going to have everyone together because we feel that it's it'll be more beneficial if we all do it collectively. You have a question? Yeah, Tina. Um, you know what that that is possible uh, we will take that into consideration uh, having it recorded right we could yeah it costs a lot of well you know we, we can look into that we can look into that yeah any other questions? Can you say that again? Yeah. Can um, more than one person from an organization participate? Definitely, time? yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then uh, we also want to make sure that everyone has signed in today. If you have not, you can go online and use that uh, Google uh, form and sign in that way because we want to make sure that we capture all of those who are here today. And then even moving forward, if someone, you know that there's someone who's interested in signing in uh, or registering for this uh, um, cohort, please have them sign in through the Google form. Any other? Oh, so it will be next year. It will be sometime oh. next year. So we haven't created that schedule yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like also the eve of the day, so they're meeting if other people. Right. Right. Someone, any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, I make sure that everybody's signed in. Right. That's why I was asking them if they haven't signed in. If, they, if you can either check off your organization name. <laughs> And or you can sign your name at the bottom. And then how are they going to sign the letter? We we're passing the letter around right now for okay. signatures. Yeah, we got several. Here's pages. a clipboard. Here's a clipboard. Yeah. Valerie. Yes. I got this one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have several pages of the same letter. Ten signatures. Uh, uh, you have a, a question? Okay. Yeah, so I didn't sign up ahead of time. I just filled out the last four. Okay. Do I need to do something? Yeah, if you can go through the Google Doc. So if anyone has received my email, it has uh, our e-blast from the chamber. It has uh, the questionnaire. All you have to do is click on the link and go through that process. If you have not, we'll make sure that you have that. I'll send it to you today. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, does the fact that you're here today and I know Valerie said there were some uh, qualifications. But the fact that we're here today guarantees that we. Oh, you're already in the program. Okay. <laughs> you are already in the program. Yes. Yeah, we're going to make this available. Well, we have to have their their demographical information right. so that we can reach out to them even further. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. But we 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 accept walk-ins. <laughs> Valerie, do you want to? Is Valerie in here? Yes. Um, before before you leave, please make sure you sign one of those letters that's going around. We have ten signatures on each page.
page, and we have circulated 10 pieces of paper. So please, before you leave, make sure. You know, I would like for Dr. Netta to talk about, can you talk about land? Uh, land. I, I, I um, served Dr. Netta with Sankofa before you all leave. If we could quiet the room a little bit. Uh, Dr. Netta is over land, which uh, represents, I, I don't know the acronym, but it was established by DCFS. Uh, and it's, and the, the main goal of land is to reduce the number of children who are in foster care. Oh. And to make sure that reunification with their family or their kin, kinship, that it moves smoothly. And it was also designed uh, to reduce the number of children going into foster care because for different reasons, it could be, uh, you know, a schools, the teachers may need, may need to be trained or our police officers may need to be trained on the proper way to handle children whenever a report has been given. So Dr. Netta, can you share, uh, talk about when? Well, you gave most of the, <laughs> <laughs> you gave most of the important information. Uh, one of the things that uh, Sankofa has done for the last several 20 some years is try to make sure that our families stay together and that DCFS follows those federal rules that are set in place that they tend to sometimes overlook. And one of the things that uh, we've done is, well, they asked me to convene uh, our people, organizations in on the west side of Chicago. And which I've done in the first, the, the first three or four meetings that we've had on Zoom have been around giving people the information to understand what land is and how we can keep our families intact. And so we uh, continue that on the last Thursday of each month mm -hmm. is to talk about how we as a community and how we uh, can keep our village together and keep our children from going into the systems. Not only just DCFS system, but you know, we have the juvenile justice system and just, just all of these systems together. So we're working on that. If you care to join us, uh, Tina sends out the notices for that. Uh, we would love to have you as your organization uh, from the community, because it shows that if we're working together, we're just much stronger. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a several of you in here. I don't know, but we need we need you because you're part of the community. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I want people to also know is we have an office on the south side, on 79th Street. So we service in Western, just the Chicago area, not 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 just the west side of Chicago. So I, I think that's important to know. But if you would like to be a part of those discussions of keeping our families together and intact, we would love to have you join us. And you said we get that information from Ms. Right, right. I'll be sending out notices uh, to everyone. Zoom. Right. We're going to the Zoom is the last, uh, last uh, Thursday in each month, and it's at ten, from 10 to 12. Right. And usually what we've been doing is having uh, speakers uh, from DCFS to, to, to tell us what they're doing on the inside. Because we can't fight on the outside if we don't know what's yeah. going on and what, what we are uh, up against. But one of the things that uh, we're doing, and we're going to work very strong on, uh, not only this session that's coming up in January, whenever they go back, is that because uh, 
most of the children that are in DCFS that are older youths are not being adopted or they're not finding homes for them. And they're not, Maifa is not working. Maifa was of the federal part that says they must reach out to find kinship, grandparents, or I don't like this word they talk about, victim kin. I don't know who came up with that word. <laughs> victim kin, right? Because our kids are not victims. Mm -hmm. They're just, we're, 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 we're not a problem people. We're a people with problems. Right. And so we need to address those from the outside. But if we don't stand up for our babies who are in that system and age out because they're not doing what they should do, then it's time for us to fight back. I, I like what Jesse Jackson always say, that if you fight, you win. <laughs> and so we're going to fight. So just like we're, we're looking at uh, working with the, the legislation of Rep. Collins, who is working with uh, the, rep, the state representative in Champaign, and I've been in contact with both of them. They're writing some legislation around kinship kids. I'm fighting for grandparents who are raising grandchildren or kinship to get as much money as foster parents do because they don't give them equal money. But it, but it, it takes just, you know. But we're going to fight even for foster parents and for kinship to get more money than what they're getting now. There's one thing that uh, state, uh, the congressman did this past year was he made sure that appropriations were brought into this this district. And the one thing that the, all across the United States happened, because he's the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, all across this country, they got more money that went into DCFS for, for foster care, for trauma, for mental health. And so I'm saying to you, I don't see that money coming out of here. <laughs> and, and we're working with it, right. and we're working in the school. Um, Deborah can tell you HSI, H, HSI is working on some of the same things. We got an appropriation, and so we're working with children in the school because of the trauma of not only gun violence, home violence, all, you know, the focus is just just, and being in our children being out of school, this really did a whole lot to our family. So we need to work with them and fight back. That's all I can say. So if we're going to be going to Springfield when the session is in, and Rep Collins is writing up in her with some other legislators are writing that uh, uh, policy um, stuff. And so we're going to be ready at when when it comes, we're gonna get a good bus, not a super bus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm too old to ride a super bus anymore. <laughs> I need a comfortable seat so we don't get a good bus to take us to, to Springfield. So we've had one session already to to to, to pair people up and to talk about um, how to talk to your legislators when they go. We want you to know the issues and the legislators. So we're going to do a whole lot of stuff around the policy because the policies that they're writing that, that, that we have to live by, we have not had to put our voice in. So I'm going to shut up. You should have never asked me. That's all right. That's all right. And so uh, we're also going to have another uh, training day uh, for those who are interested in learning how to become, an, how to be an advocate. Just know. You all are advocates. You are advocates already yes. because you're here today. So that lets you know that um, you're on the right path. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have another workshop, uh, and we'll let you all know so that you can participate with us as well. All righty. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. And Pastor Edie, are, is, is he still here? He disappeared. Oh, I, I, I was looking for your man. You want to close us out in prayer? Okay. Thank you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love and honor and thank you for what you have provided. And thank you for Father and, and uh, 
uh, from the many that are working along with her. So I think it's very valuable information to us. So now, God, we ask that you will bless all the efforts of every organization represented here on today. And we will all be able to make a great impact on our community. And we thank you for this opportunity. Amen. Amen. Class is finished. <laughs>